for .NET, yes, 20 years. It's amazing. I, I, it I, I is. say old, by the way. I say well seasoned. <laughs> You know, like like Ooh, a bit cheese. Nice. <laughs> Experienced. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. No, it's oh, amazing like how that. far .NET has come. Like you can do so many things yeah. now. You can build games. You can do AI. You can do web, cloud, desktop, mobile. It's it does it all. It is a uh, it has come a long, long way, and the future is yeah. Back. It is, mm -hmm. and I know some of us, even like Blazor particularly. <laughs> well, doesn't everyone? Uh, oh. Everyone should like Blazor. <laughs> yeah, I hear Jimmy does does know a, t a thing or two about Blazor. May have written. Uh, I think I've heard about it. And, uh, <laughs> I've heard all sorts of stuff with it. It's great. Everyone it's all that true. it's all true. Everyone that has used JavaScript loves Blazor. <laughs> no, 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 no. We we should we should clear that up. Everyone from the C sharp world that does not enjoy JavaScript loves Blazor automatically. It's not. We're not bashing on the people who likes JavaScript. You're all fine. Stay where you are. It's fine. But you're. But Just you're to wrong. make sure. <laughs> this is why you don't win JavaScript any prizes. Uh, okay. We love Microsoft. We love JavaScript. We we have yeah. Visual Studio Code and TypeScript. Yeah. And I honestly like. I, there's a lot of things about JavaScript that I think are very elegant. Yeah. We we had a session today about JavaScript also. So. We did. For we Blazor did. developers, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and and uh, it might be uh, swearing in the church or something, but I prefer Visual Studio Code over Visual Studio, so I'm sorry. It's okay, I'll see myself out now. <laughs> <laughs> but let's uh, let's let let's uh, talk some Blazor. Let's talk some Blazor. Blazor time. Let's give the stage to Dan. All right, take Thank it away. So Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Jessica. Daniel. Uh, it's great to be here, everyone. Hello, I am Daniel Roth. I'm a program manager on the ASP.NET team, and I'm happy to be here with you all for .NET Front End Day. Uh, in this session, uh, we're going to look at the latest Blazor features in .NET 6 for building modern full-stack web apps with just .NET. Uh, we'll also look at the future of Blazor in .NET 7 and how Blazor is expanding beyond the web. Uh, to enable native client development as well with .NET MAUI. So Blazor is a full stack web UI framework. Well, it enables full stack web UI development uh, based on HTML, CSS, and C Sharp instead of JavaScript. With Blazor, you can build full stack web apps combined with ASP.NET Core with just .NET and using the open web. Blazor is part of ASP.NET Core, our modern web UI framework, uh, web framework for .NET. ASP.NET Core has everything you need to build modern web apps. Uh, the addition of Blazor to ASP.NET Core expands the reach of your .NET web apps to the client. ASP.NET Core and Blazor are deeply integrated. Uh, you can use your Blazor components from your existing views, like your MVC views and Razor pages. And you can use ASP.NET Core to pre-render your components and handle all of your backend needs. The latest Blazor features are now available with .NET 6, uh, which is the latest uh, long-term support release for .NET, or LTS release. Uh, Blazor in .NET 6 is loaded with new features. We now have support for Hot Reload, which is the ability to make changes to your app while it's running without having to you know, restart it and rebuild it. Uh, we have much smaller download sizes for Blazor WebAssembly apps. Uh, we added a new tool chain for doing WebAssembly ahead of time compilation for Blazor WebAssembly apps, which dramatically improves the runtime performance of the app. Uh, you can also add native dependencies to your Blazor WebAssembly apps using that same tool chain. We added support for error boundaries, dynamic component rendering. You can now render Blazor components from JavaScript if you have existing JavaScript apps that you want to add some Blazor to. And just so much more. There is a ton of Blazor in .NET 6, a um, ton of other features just in .NET 6, 6 in general, way more than we have time to cover in just this session. But we'll try and see as much of it as we can. We'll try and touch on as many of these new features as possible. Getting started with Blazor with .NET 6 is super easy. You just go to blazor.net, you install the latest .NET SDK, and then you can get going building your first Blazor app on your preferred platform using Visual Studio. Uh, Visual Studio for Mac or Visual Studio Code if you're if you're Jessica. All right, let's let's take a look. Let's just dive right into it. Let's go take a look at some of these new features. 
uh, by getting started with a new Blazor app. Okay, so I have Visual Studio 2022 here. I'm using the, the latest preview. And I'm just going to file a new project and create a Blazor app. For this app, I'm going to use Blazor Server. Could just as easily use Blazor WebAssembly. I find Blazor Server is a good place to start if you're just using Blazor for the, for the first time. And we'll use, of course, .NET 6. All right, so here's our Blazor project. And right off the bat, there's some really nice improvements to the uh, Blazor project templates, really all the ASP.NET Core project templates. Um, this is using the new min minimal hosting model. So you'll notice there's no startup class in, the, in this file. Um, that's because all of that startup logic is now in program CS, and we're using the new web application API for setting up our host and getting our app running. It's just a little simpler. If you have a startup class and you want to continue to using one, uh, continue to use one, you of course can, can do that as well. Uh, but this is where I've got all of my services that I'm configured, as well as any middleware that makes up my uh, request handling pipeline for this application. We're also using all the latest C Sharp features in the templates. Uh, for example, we were using top level statements in this project template. That's why you don't see a program class or a static void main function. It's just some extra ceremony that we no longer need with modern C Sharp. We're also using implicit using directives. So our stack of using directives at the top is much shorter. And we can use uh, file scoped namespaces. So if we go open like a C Sharp file, you can just declare your namespace at the top and shift all your code to the left to get a little bit more space for, for your coding. Okay, so some nice some nice things added to the templates. Let's go ahead and get this running. I'm just gonna control F5 to, to run the application. And that popped up over here on my other monitor. Let me snap this side by side with Visual Studio. Gives ourselves a little bit more room. Okay, so this is a Blazor app. It looks like every Blazor app that you may have seen for a long time when you create it from the default template, but it does have some new bells and whistles that are worth pointing out. Uh, first of all, the UI here is using the latest version of Bootstrap. So if we dig into like the sources and look at the Bootstrap version that we're using right there, yeah, we're using Bootstrap 5.1. So you're getting all the, the benefits of using the latest version of Bootstrap. Uh, I can click around to these different tabs and see the weather forecast table and this counter component. Click the button, count goes up. No JavaScript required. That was all done with C Sharp. Notice though the, the browser tab that as I click, the title is being updated accordingly. Um, this is a new feature in Blazor in .NET 6 that you can now influence the head of the HTML page from your Blazor components. Let me show you, show you what that looks like in code. If we look at like the counter component, you can see up at the top, we have this new page title component that lets you set the title for the, for the page. And then in, I think it's in layout.cshtml, this is like the host page on the server for this Blazor app. We have this new head outlet component that's a component that's going to gather up all the changes that you want to do to the HTML head and then apply them to, to the head. And that will work both with pre-rendering and also when the app is set up client-side for interactivity. Got a little something in my eye. OK, great. So that's really cool. You can now influence the head in, uh, of your HTML pages, set the title, and all that type of stuff. OK, cool. Let's also make some edits to this app. Let me uh, give myself even more space. And let's go to index.razor. And collapse that uh, hamburger. And let's just add some code here. So I'm just going to add some excitement to Hello World. And then I'm going to click this fancy new hot reload button up here at the top. This is going to apply the changes that I just made to the running application without having to like rebuild and restart. So click. And almost immediately, we see the UI update with the, the, the new markup changes. So the app is still running, didn't have to, to restart. We can also make other changes, like let's mess around with this component parameter. Now, isn't this so cool? And we'll hot reload that. And almost immediately, it shows up on the page. It's really fast and crisp. Um, we can do more than just uh, markup. We can uh, we can add components to the page. Let's add a counter component right there. And I've set the setting right here that says hot reload on file save. So I'm just going to you know, save the, the file. And then now we've got a counter component. Click it a few times. Let's also add the fetch data component. We'll just add all the components while we're at it onto the home page. And we'll save that. And again, almost immediately, we get our weather forecast uh, table right there on the, the home page. Now, notice the count. Uh, is still there. Like it didn't get reset when I added the, the the weather forecast table. That's because we're updating the app while it's running. Any app state that you had is preserved. So if you're like deep into a nested form or you're messing around with a complicated tree view, you can update the UI without having to recreate all of that application state. 
Uh, we can also do C sharp updates. Let's go into counter.razor and we'll update the increment count method to instead increment by one, it will now increment by two. So we'll save that. Now, if I click the counter, we're incrementing by two. Uh, and we can do this with just C sharp files as well. Like I'm going to go into this uh, weather forecast service.cs. This is the service that we're using to generate that weather forecast data. And let's change all the summaries to be uppercase. So I'll do that and just save that. And I see the little check mark that says the hot reload applied, but we're not seeing that update. Like, why not? Why am I not seeing these all capitalized? Well, there is a reason. Um, remember, hot reload is changing the code of the app while it's running. If that code has already run and nothing re-triggers it to run again, then you're not going to see the results of the change. Um, this fetch data component, it fetches the weather forecast data in its uninitialized method, like when the component is first set up, like when you browse to that tab, nothing's triggered on initialize to run again. So we don't see the changes, but we can trigger it by just like going to a different tab and then coming back. And yeah, now we see our, you know, all caps uh, summary. So that, that's a, it's a new way of thinking about the code changes that you're making. Um, just remember that if you make a hot, hot reload change, you got to do whatever it takes to get that code to actually re-execute. Initialization logic, you might have to re-trigger the initialization logic. All right. So we can do hot reload of Razor. We can do C Sharp. Um, we can also do uh, CSH, um, CSS files. So let's go into the style sheet for this application. That's this site.css file. And I'm going to try and mess around with the color of the, the buttons. Let's change the background color to red or yellow or purple. I mean, this is .NET. You've got to have some purple. And you notice, like, as I type, it's updating. I'm not even having to, to save. Visual Studio is detecting the CSS changes and hot reloading those into the running app to apply them to the, to the DOM. So you can do CSS as well. So that's hot reload for Blazor Infinite 6. So those are a bunch of niceties for new Blazor apps that are uh, new in this latest release. Let's go back to my slides. All right. Also new in .NET 6 are the .NET WebAssembly build tools. This is a new tool chain that we've added that allows you to manipulate your Blazor WebAssembly apps for a bunch of cool scenarios. Uh, the first is ahead of time compilation. Uh, by default, Blazor WebAssembly apps run on a .NET runtime that you deploy with the app. It gets downloaded to the browser that's implemented in WebAssembly. And that runtime is an IL interpreter. It's going to interpret the instructions in your .NET assemblies. Uh, there's no JIT. So it's not particularly fast for like CPU intensive work. It's fine for a whole bunch of scenarios, but if you're trying to like, I don't know, do ray tracing or physics simulations in a browser, it can be a little bit slower. Ahead of time compilation allows you to pre-compile your .NET code to WebAssembly up front for much better runtime performance. Runtime linking is the ability to remove features from the .NET WebAssembly runtime that you don't need, like uh, debugging features. Well, after you're published, you probably don't need those. You just pull those out. Or uh, globalization features. If you're not globalizing your app, maybe you don't know, need those either. So you can pull them out. This can reduce the size, the download size of your Blazor WebAssembly app. And then native dependencies is the ability to add stuff to the .NET WebAssembly runtime um, that comes from you know, potentially native code, like some C code or a native library that you want to be able to use from a browser. That's enabled as well. Speaking of download size, uh, the smallest Blazor WebAssembly app that you could have in .NET 5 uh, was about 1.7 megabytes, which is Pretty impressive, considering that includes the, the runtime, like the .NET WebAssembly runtime, the core framework libraries, uh, Blazor itself, and your app. That was all packed into that 1.7 megabytes. Not bad, but we can do better. In .NET 6, the smallest Blazor WebAssembly app is only a megabyte, about a 40% size reduction. This is thanks to work on the you know, runtime relinking feature that allows us to trim the WebAssembly bundle quite a bit and also improvements to the .NET uh, IL trimmer that trims your .NET code. It statically analyzes your app to remove any code that's, that's not needed. So both of those resulted in a much smaller app. Let me show you these uh, new build tools. They're kind of cool. All right, I think we can close this app. And I'm going to switch to a different app, which is the Satellite Simulator application. OK, so now to get the .NET WebAssembly build tools, what you got to do is you got to open up the Visual Studio installer. And in the yeah, ASP.NET and Web Development workload, you're going to want to check this checkbox right here, .NET WebAssembly build tools. It's an optional component, so it's not enabled by default. You have to say, yeah, I want these things because I'm doing some Blazor WebAssembly stuff. OK, now 
let's go ahead. I'm going to run this app first, just, you know, uh, um, uh, in development and see what we get. And what we have here is a simple little physics simulation. This is like a two star system and we've got a bunch of satellites and it's simulating the physics of, of all these satellites in this space, okay? And we can fiddle with um, how many satellites there are and then watch the frame rate up here in the upper right-hand corner. We wanna keep the frame rate above 60 frames per second. So let's add you know, 10 times more satellites, you know, a thousand of them. Let's, uh, let's do 5,000 satellites, still at 60 frames per second. We can do 8,000 satellites. Still at 60 frames per second. 10 is usually where we start to see a little dive. Yeah, okay. So now we're getting a little bit slower. And this is just using the .NET IO interpreter, also with a debug build of your assemblies. Okay? Um, we can do better. Let's uh, let's try and publish this app. Now that we have the .NET WebAssembly build tools, when we publish this app, it will um, do a release build, for one thing. So that'll make it faster. It will also trim the, the WebAssembly runtime and all of the .NET DLLs to remove any unused code and make the app small. OK, so let's go and see that. So I've already set up a publish profile here. So I just do publish. And this should automatically kick in by just having the, the build tools. So I'm going to do this runtime relinking publish profile. And I've already done it just to save on time. Let me make sure I've stopped the previous app so I don't get any port conflicts. So let me run this version of the app that has had uh, runtime relinking done. We'll start this again. OK, so this is now a published version of the app with runtime relinking. And let's see how we do for performance wise. So 1,000. Can we do 10,000? Yes, we're fine at 10,000. About 15,000, still at 60 frames per second. And usually it's at like 20,000. Yeah, we start to see a dip in the frame rate, OK? So we're able to do you know twice as much work now with a release build. So that's good. So the message there is the IL interpreter is quite capable. If you, if, if For many scenarios, it's more than adequate. Um, what's also really cool is if we look at the download size of this app, let me go and clear out all the caches so we get a true look of what the download size looks like. And yeah, down here, the whole app is just 1.1 megabytes transfer. So way smaller than you know what the smallest Blazor WebAssembly app was with, with .NET 5. And part of the trick for that is that this .NET.WASM file, this guy right here, um, that's the WebAssembly runtime. It was trimmed to only like you know 350 kilobytes or so. Uh, in order to do that, I did put a couple of settings in the app to set, tell it that I, there's features I don't need. Like I, I turned off, uh, what did I turn off? I turned off, uh, I turned on invariant globalization. So I don't need any of the globalization stuff. And I also um, removed all the time zone data because I don't need, didn't need that stuff for this application. And as a result, I was able to shrink it way down. Now, performance-wise though, we can still do better using ahead of time compilation. To turn that on, I got to now set this option to true. And that will then turn on uh, ahead of time compilation and then pu republish the app. So right click publish and AOT will kick in on publish. It does take a while. So you don't want to be doing it during dev. It will slow down your dev inner loop by quite a bit. Uh, I've already done the publish. So let's go ahead. No, that's runtime really. Quick. We want to do AOT. I've already done a publish. Let me stop the app that I had previously running and let's do the ahead of time compiled version of this app. Get that up and going. Okay. So now this is AOT compiled. Uh, we can do 1,000, 10,000, still at 60 frames, about 100,000. A little dip, but we're back up at 60 frames per second. Can we do 120? Uh, not quite. A little bit of a dip at 120, but still pretty good. You know, about five to 10 times faster runtime performance with AOT. So that's great. And I know this is probably getting people a headache. So let me, let me get rid of all that white noise. Uh, so that's what that's the benefit of AOT. Everything was pre-compiled up front for that performance benefit. There is a catch, which is um, doing AOT will also increase the download size of the app. So if we clear the cache again for this app and look at how big it is, Oh yeah, so like the the runtime now is 2.1 megabytes, you know, about a 2x size increase. That's because we took all of your .NET code and had it, you know, turned it into WebAssembly and linked it into that bundle. So you get a larger initial download size, so slower load time, but much better runtime performance. Um, that's a trade-off. What I would say is, if you have CPU intensive work where you need this perf benefit, then go ahead and use AOT. If you don't need it, the runtime interpreter will be just fine. All right. Um, we can also do native dependencies. Let me switch from this app to a different app so we can see that. Uh, I've got this Blazor WebAssembly Demos app. 
So native dependencies is the ability to use native code from your Blazor WebAssembly app. Let me just go ahead and run this so you can see what it does. This is a, a demo app that the um, the owner of the Skia Sharp library set up, uh, Matthew Liebowitz, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Uh, let me start with this, this page of the Blazor app. This looks simple, right? It just says two times four is eight. Nothing shocking there. But what's interesting is how that's implemented. If we go into the page, we can see that that Razor uh, component, uh, here's where it's rendering two times four equals, and then it's doing a C sharp call. That's what that at sign is, is representing. And it's calling this method, which is a DLL import. And that DLL import is calling into some C code, which is uh, up here in this file.c uh, file. And then there's the, our actual multiply uh, method. And the way that gets wired into your app is there's this little native file reference. Oh, let me make it bigger so you can actually see. Native file reference um, MS build uh, item group that you you add stuff to. You can add like whole libraries. So that that page is actually calling into C code to calculate uh, eight. And with this functionality, you can do some really really interesting things. So for example, Skia is a native graphics library. I think it's built by Google. Skia Sharp is like a .NET wrapper around that native uh, cross-platform uh, uh, graphics library. And now with this functionality, you can add a reference to Skia Sharp from a Blazor WebAssembly app and then do custom graphics rendering using Skia Sharp that's been compiled to WebAssembly. Okay, so that's like this tab down here that's showing a like, you know, simple clock that's being drawn on the screen at 60 frames per second. That's all done using Skia Sharp's .NET APIs, which is calling into Skia. I'll show you quickly what that looks like. Uh, that's this last Razor page. So here we're, um, oh, we got this, uh, yeah, this this component is uh, the Skia Sharp like view, and it has this on paint service, uh, surface uh, callback that you get handed a method. And so this thing's getting called over and over again. And it's then just using standard uh, Skia Sharp APIs to call into Skia, all from a browser from .NET code on WebAssembly. So super cool. Uh, you can play around with that. In fact, there was uh, someone who did like a whole game. I think it's like trains.net. Yeah, this thing. This is a little like train simulator that's built using Blazor WebAssembly and that Skia Sharp uh, functionality. So if you want to take a look at that and play around with it, it's, it's pretty fun. OK, so that's native dependencies. All right, let's go back to my slides. All right, you can also in .NET 6, call um, Blazor components now from JavaScript. So if you have a Blazor component and you have like some existing, you know, Angular, React, whatever, JavaScript-based applications, and you want to reuse those Blazor components, you can now do that. This is a fairly low-level abstraction in .NET 6. It's a low-level API for uh, rendering a Blazor component using a, a JavaScript API. But on top of that, we, you can build all sorts of interesting things. Uh, we have a sample that actually will code generate Blazor, uh, not not Blazor, Angular components around a Blazor component, so you can then use them in an Angular app. Uh, we also have a preview package that lets you generate standards-based custom elements from a Blazor component that you can then use in a JavaScript-based application. That's what I was going to show you just real quick. So over here, I have this Blazor custom elements project. This project is actually just the default ASP.NET Core plus Angular project template that ships in .NET 6. But I added a Blazor component, this counter.razor file. And then I added the um, preview package for creating custom elements from Blazor components. That's this guy right here. So ASP.NET Core components custom elements that you can get off of NuGet. And then what you do is you just register your Blazor component as a custom element. That's the, the way you do it. You do it as like, like you would a, a root element. And you got to give it a name. And the name has to have these dashes in it. It's something to do with the the way custom elements are defined, OK? So if I run this, uh, we should end up with a Angular app. This is just the default Angular template. And it takes a little while to start because JavaScript. <laughs> Sorry, Jessica. <laughs> yeah, uh, we got to wait for the, uh, you know, the Webpack dev server to fire up. But once that loads, then we should see our Angular app. There it goes. OK, so this is all Angular code. Oh, I've already got my Blazor component there. Well, well, I'll show you how I did that. But this is the this is an Angular counter, and on the home page, what I want is this Blazor counter, which you can see I, I already left in. But uh, let's go look at where that was added. We go into the Angular part of this app, and we look at app home home component .html. So this is all the content for this Angular page right there. And all I did was add this element. Let me let me remove it. If I save it and remove it, then that Blazor component disappears. But now I'm going to add it back. 
and save it. And boop, now we've got a Blazor component being rendered from an Angular component. So super nice. You can now use Blazor components from any front end uh, web application. All right, so that's kind of cool. Let me go back to slides. Um, this didn't ship with .NET 6, but it shipped alongside .NET 6, is that we now have Fluent UI components uh, available for Blazor. This is a library of 40 or more, um, uh, more than 40 Blazor components that support dark mode and light mode and high contrast. Um, they support the Fluent UI design patterns, which is used by a bunch of you know, uh, big Microsoft products like Windows and Office and Teams. Um, they support the latest Windows 11 visuals, and you can try them out by going to aka.ms slash Blazor Fluent UI. OK, now everything we've talked about so far was all about web apps. Um, but what if you need more than what a web app can do? Like, what if you need uh, more than what the web platform offers, and you need full access to the native capabilities of the underlying device? What if you need, basically, a native client app? Well, we've been hard at work, uh, as I'm sure you've seen in this conference today, on the new .NET multi-platform app UI, or .NET MAUI, uh, which is the future of cross-platform UI for .NET. With .NET MAUI, you can build a single app that runs on mobile and desktop, Android, iOS, uh, Windows, and Mac. Uh, it's the evolution of Xamarin Forms with an improved architecture and uh, better development experience. Uh, .NET MAUI is expected to release in early Q2 of this year. And there's been lots of great talks about it today, including the talk uh, just prior to this from, from James Montemagno that talked about the Blazor integration in .NET MAUI. So with your .NET MAUI applications, you can actually add Blazor components. Um, .NET MAUI basically enables you as a web developer to create native client apps by integrating your existing Blazor components and using your existing .NET web development skills. Um, these components run directly in the .NET app, uh, and they allow you to then share web UI between your web apps and your native, uh, native applications. This is how it works. So in a uh, .NET MAUI Blazor app, your components run directly in the .NET MAUI process. So they're running on a normal .NET runtime. WebAssembly is not involved. So they run fast, and they have full access to the native capabilities of the device through the .NET platform. Uh, we call this pattern, uh, this hosting model, Blazor Hybrid. Um, Blazor, because it's a hybrid of web UI and, uh, and native code. Blazor, hi Blazor Hybrid apps let you use your .NET web skills to build native client apps with web UI that can then be shared with your web apps. All right, and I, was, I'm sh I know I'm getting kind of short on time, but let me just show you real quick. So in order to get Maui, you're going to want to install the latest preview version of Visual Studio, and then make sure you install this Maui develop, uh, sorry, mobile development with .NET um, workload. And when you do that, you should see this you know, .NET Maui preview checkbox. Okay, So it's still in preview, but it's getting close to, to shipping. And then when you want to create an app, all you got to do is file a new project and create a new, go to Maui, uh, .NET Maui Blazor application. Okay. And we'll create that. I don't think we need to save the previous one. And now what we have is a Blazor app that's hosted in a Maui application. Let me, I'm going to show you the Windows version. All right. Get that running. And so the Maui app can target Windows, Android, iOS, and uh, Mac. And what we've got in this application, if we look at the code for the template, is um, you know normally you would put in your these XAML files native UI, but we only have really one uh, native Maui control here, which is this Blazor WebView control. And what the Blazor WebView control does is it lets you render Blazor Blazor components to an embedded WebView. Here, the component I want to render is this main component, which is defined in main.razor. And if you've seen a Blazor project, that should look really familiar. That's basically the default Blazor router, and it will happily route. Uh, navigations then to these Blazor components that also sit in the Maui project. Like here's the counter component and the fetch data component and so forth. So if we look at our, here's our native desktop app. This is a Blazor app, a Blazor hybrid app being hosted in .NET Maui with all the, the UI. This whole section here, whoops, this whole section here is just one web view control that our Blazor components are then rendering to. Rendering to. So now what's really cool is how you can now share UI between the Maui app and the Blazor app. So I'm going to hop on to uh, to get another project in here. I want to add a Blazor app to this thing. Let's add a Blazor server project, and let's add also uh, 
a project with some Razor components that we want to share. So I'm going to add a Razor class library. Like that, and create that. OK, so this Razor class library has a simple little component that's just a div with some styling. And I'm going to add a reference to my Maui project to that Razor class library like this, and also to my Blazor application, of course, like this. OK, and so now when I, uh, if I go to my Maui app, I should be able to add that Blazor component into index.razor. Let's go ahead and add it right, right here. So I'm going to add component one right on the home page. We'll save that and we'll rerun the Windows version of the app. So I should see my Blazor component now showing up on the Windows desktop app. Let me close this guy down. And then play succeeded. OK, cool. So now you can see there's my component one from Razor class library one. And then let me go ahead and set my web application as a startup project. And we'll just go ahead and run that as it is. OK, so we got a web application now over here. It's a little big. Let me make it a little smaller so I can see things. And we'll go into the uh, home page for the web app and also add component one uh, right there. And we should be able to just hot reload that in. And there it is. OK, so we have now native desktop using a Blazor UI component. I mean, everything in here is a Blazor web UI component and a web application that's sharing the UI. And this, of course, works equally well with, with Android. But I'm going to avoid running it because, yeah, the Android emulator can be a little bit on the slow side. But the whole goal here is that you can now take your Blazor know-how. Well, uh, let me get to that. Where's my slide? Uh, do, do, do. This one. You can take your Blazor know-how and share your Blazor web UI components across web, desktop, and mobile. Now I know James promised you that I would show you this. So I will I will highlight this as well, which is we're not just doing Blazor web view controls for Maui. We're also going to do them for WPF and WinForms. This will allow you to take your older desktop apps. That's a real desktop app, by the way, from Spot like Explorer. They build like a laundry. Uh, dry cleaning uh, uh, solutions, like point of sale solutions, and they modernized it using Blazor. You'll be able to do this too you, by using a Blazor web view control in WPF and WinForms apps. So I'll just to show you that that is actually the case because James made me pr uh, promise uh, that I would show it. Uh, here is a Blazor WinForms application. This is a, a .NET 6 Windows Forms application that also has a Blazor web view control. Let's see if it gets in here. Yeah, view code. So here we're setting up a Blazor web view control, and then we're going to render our main component. Let's go ahead and run this. Now we have a WinForms app with Blazor inside of it. So you can do that and with WPF as well. So that's all coming in the uh, Maui timeframe. All right. I know I'm over time, so I'm going to try and zip through one last thing, which is, um, you know, what's next after Maui and after... Uh, uh, shipping those Blazor WebView controls. Well, we're on a yearly cadence with .NET. So .NET 7 is shipping in November of 2022, November of this year. And we're already actively working on our .NET 7 deliverables for Blazor. Here's what's on the roadmap. We're going to do a whole bunch of hot reload improvements uh, so that you can uh, do more types of edits with Blazor WebAssembly projects in particular uh, than are currently supported today. So it'll be more like the experience you get with uh, core CLR-based workloads. We're all, we will also enable hot reload when debugging for Blazor WebAssembly apps. That's something that doesn't work today, but it will soon. Uh, we will do some improvements to AOT compilation so that you can have like a mixed mode of part of the app being AOT and part of it not. That'll allow you to tune like how much do you what, what you can just optimize the the performance critical paths and leave the rest interpreted so you can tweak the balance of download size versus runtime performance. Uh, we're improving the performance of AOT compiled code even further. We're looking at enable multi-threading for Blazor WebAssembly apps in .NET 7. Uh, we're going to uh, enable a bunch of the uh, crypto APIs from .NET in a browser using the browser's subtle crypto support. Uh, we're also going to try and give you support for calling .NET uh, code from WebAssembly when you don't really need all of Blazor in the picture. Like if you just want to call a library, you're not really using Blazor UI components. We're going to make that possible too. Um, the custom element support that I showed, it's currently in preview, but we plan to ship it with .NET 7. Uh, for people doing micro front-end apps, uh, we're going to make it so that you can have multiple Blazor apps on the same page that are potentially using different Blazor versions. Could be Blazor Server, Blazor WebAssembly. That way you can have multiple teams bring, building parts of, the, of your web UI independently. 
Uh, we're carrying forward the work that we had we had started in .NET 6 for Blazor Server to enable pausing and resuming Blazor Server apps and giving you more control over the circuit lifetimes. A bunch of improvements coming for pre-rendering uh, when you have authentication enabled, for example, improvements to, to bind, uh, and also some cleanup of the uh, Blazor templates. We'll probably give you an empty template if you don't want to have a purple gradient in every single one of your Blazor apps. And Razor Editor improvements, of course, are also coming uh, to the new Razor Editor in Visual Studio 2022. If you want to dig into more of the details here, I know I kind of flew through that. Check out our roadmap at aka.ms slash aspinet slash roadmap. And with that, thank you so much for listening. And I'm happy to stick around and answer some questions questions in the time that remains. Sorry for not leaving a ton of time. I went a little bit over. Hello again. Hello. Hi. How are you going to be able to give us all those amazing things? W one feature at a time, like an elephant. Uh, <laughs> we have a great <laughs> team. Like there's a, we have the whole Maui team and the Blazor team are collaborating. Um, the Blazor team, we, we work uh, hand in hand with the folks on the ASP.NET Core team and the .NET Runtime team to get all those WebAssembly features in. It is a, a team effort as well as, you know, a lot of help from folks in the community, like folks like, like you guys that send us PRs and give us feedback. So yeah, that's, that's how we're going to do it. We're going to do it together. <laughs> I can't wait. It was a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah, we had a couple of questions also. Some of them we have had still from James sessions, but I think you can answer them too. Sure. So we can start with them. Can a Blazor app and a native uh, component share state? Yeah, absolutely. This is this is what's really cool about this model. Those Blazor components are just running in the Maui app. They're just C-sharp classes at the end of the day. We take your Razor files, we compile them into a C-sharp class, and then we just run them. So you can like inject, uh, configure services using DI and have those services be injected into your native, native parts of your Maui app and into your Blazor components. It's all just one happy .NET app. Oops. Hmm? Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Sorry. I got, um, but, yeah, but it was exactly actually a very, very good comment. So many good things. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. That there was so You're many welcome. good things. Thank you so much for watching. Okay, so we can take this questions. Is it possible to have drag and drop controls in Blazor design? I guess in, they mean designer, like uh, civilized development. Oh, oh, like a like a designer like surface for 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 Blazor. So yeah. um, so we don't we don't currently have plans internally at Microsoft to build a like you know WYSIWYG style designer for for Blazor components. There are like third party or, or community offerings that uh, that do that. Um, I know, uh, I think Radzen has a like you know rapid application development environment that's kind of a drag and drop like thing. I seem to recall that it was one of the component vendors in Fragistics has has something. There there are some 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 offerings out there, but from Microsoft proper, we we don't have any plans to build one yet. There are some discussions, like you know, it comes up. People ask about it. People like having a. Uh, uh, designers to simplify the, the and make themselves more more productive, uh, but it is a big investment also. Uh, so we're trying to figure out what's the right uh, right balance there. Yeah, we okay. got a tip uh, from from the community right now. Mud Blazor is good, Alex. Uh... Mud Blazor is a fantastic component library uh, that is available. There's that, there's a bunch of them. Um, yeah, uh, those are like uh, free open source libraries of components that you can just use. Yeah, Mud, Mud Blazor is very good. There's Blazor Strap. The Radzen has a bunch of components. If you're looking for open source um, options for Blazor, I would point you to the Awesome Blazor repo. It's at aka.ms slash Awesome Blazor. It's a, basically a GitHub repo where the community maintains a listing of every single Blazor project out there. There are, of course, also the commercial offerings from all the big component vendors like Telerik and so forth. Yes. Another question, how much of these features are going to be so important in .NET 5, or does it does it that features complete, no more coming? I didn't really get the question. But <laughs> yeah, I think this is saying, hey, I'm still on .NET 5, and you're showing me all these great features, but I'm not on .NET 6 yet. Um, you should move to .NET 6. It's a highly compatible release. Like the upgrade from .NET 5 to .NET 6 should be pretty painless. We would work very hard to make to, to make it that way. So yeah, definitely update to .NET 6. It's the latest long-term support release. So once you're on .NET 6, you've got a three-year support lifetime that you can then just ride. Um, .NET 5 was a current release, so it actually only has an 18-month support cycle. 
Um, so within the next, you know, uh, six months or so, you're going to really want to move to .NET 6 if, if you can. And it should be easy. If it's it not, let us know, but it should be. It took us one minute to upgrade the .NET front end. Well, I, so .NET, <laughs> uh, it's not yeah. a big, it's not a big site, but it was uh, really easy. Uh, okay, uh, let's see here. Current Blazor Hot Reload consumes large amounts of CPU and memory if left running for more than a few minutes. When are improvements expected to be released that solve this issue? Yeah, so we, we have heard some, uh, I mean, Hot Reload is a brand new feature, hot off the press. Um, we have heard some feedback that are some some rough edges still. Uh, some people saying they, they can't get it to work or it's um, or it's actually not being very fast like it was for me. Like um, as you saw in those, my scenario was very, very quick. There are some degenerate cases that we have had reports of that we're uh, tracking down. So um, I would first say try the latest Visual Studio preview. Like if you're if you haven't tried out uh, 17.1, the latest preview, it's it, I think it's going to be stable here very very shortly anyway. So the preview is almost done. Uh, give that a shot and see if that fixes your issues. If it's not fixing your issues and you're still having problems with hot reload, please send us feedback. Um, use the VS send feedback button. That's the best way to do it because it captures a whole bunch of of logging and telemetry data that we can use to figure out what's going on there. Uh, there are a bunch. Uh, there is a bunch of work right now to, to further polish, shall we say, the hot reload experience uh, in VS. And so, with each VS update, you should see it getting better and better. Okay. I've heard about WebAssembly proposal for garbage collection support. Do you think this could be leveraged by Blaze WebAssembly in the future? Possibly, yes. Um, so um, the, that's, I, I wish we had folks from the, the WebAssembly runtime team here. The, I, I, what I can tell you, I can't speak specifically to how garbage collection will be utilized. Um, what I, it's probably, um, there's probably a misconception that I, some people look at that spec and think, oh, that means that uh, uh, .NET will be able to use this WebAssembly garbage collection feature for its garbage collection. That's probably not the case because we have very specific garbage uh, collection semantics in .NET that we have to honor. And this other garbage collection implementation is probably not going to line up exactly right. But there still may be uh, places where we can leverage it. We keep very close eye on the latest uh, evolutions of the WebAssembly specs and using those features in the runtime as they become available. Um, and you know, as the browser gets better, .NET on, on the web platform just gets better. Multi-threading, hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, uh, is one of those features where we were waiting for like shared array buffer support uh, to be across all browsers. And Safari finally uh, got their acts to that <laughs> together and implemented it, and uh, they shipped it in December. So that's why we're now looking at that for .NET 7. There's a bunch of other uh, features in that space, um, including using uh, .NET for on WebAssembly for server scenarios. That, that's becoming a more interesting use case. Like maybe you want to have these very isolated server workloads that are running in, on a WebAssembly-based runtime uh, through the, um, there's a, the WASI system interf interface that we're looking at and uh, look at, looking at supporting those scenarios too. So lots of interesting stuff happening in the WebAssembly standard space. We keep close tabs on it and we react accordingly. Okay. Let's continue. Will there be an empty hybrid project template in .NET 7 <laughs> next to empty Blazor yeah. Western server project templates? We don't like like the purple, uh, the, the <laughs> counter in every single one of your apps. Um, I think I I'm think with say, Minion here. <laughs> I think I could say yes. We will. We we are. Uh, the plan is to have like a at least. With, I know we've talked about this for the web templates. We haven't talked about hybrid yet, but having like a checkbox that you can say, "I don't want any of that stuff in there." Just like give me a a blank slate, and then let Jessica make it beautiful for me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I support it even if I need a designer to make it beautiful. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, it's good to have the choice. Yeah, true. Uh, so. Just curious if cursing params are now fully supported in routing in Blazor applications. Yeah, actually, we, we did that. In, uh, that was there's a lot of features in 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 .NET six, and I, I I used to show like a slide with it all packed on there, and I just kind of gave up because it was too much to, to lift. Go, <laughs> definitely go check out the What's New doc in ASP.NET Core and .NET six, and it has all the Blazor features there. Mm -hmm. But we did did support uh, added support for like binding to query string parameters. And we added helper methods for like manipulating the query string on the page. So that 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 is available now in .NET 6 with Blazor. Great. Are there still plans to do Blazor drag and drop? So we <laughs> <laughs> we had on had this on our plans for .NET 6, and 
um, we looked at it, in particular, my good friend Steve Sanderson looked at it. And the conclusion was is there's, there's a lot of ways to do drag and drop from within Blazor. And we didn't feel good about us being able to provide a single abstraction that would work for all cases. Um, you, so the story right now is you do have to do, and I know, plug your ears if, you, if this offends you, a little bit of JavaScript <laughs> to do full drag and drop <laughs> in, in Blazor. It's not a lot. It's just, it's just a little bit. Um, you will survive, don't... Jimmy. <laughs> not sure. I'm not I sure. Find some blog post by like Chris Sainty or somebody, and they'll tell you how to do it. And you just copy and paste. It, it's it's not that hard. We don't plan to add it directly into the framework. There are also community packages that will set you up with various patterns for doing drag and drop in Blazor that you can just go and install and use. Um, so no, that's not currently on the the slate for .NET seven. Uh, we are also, you know, .NET seven is also split between. We got to get the Blazor hybrid stuff done with Maui and then try and go deliver a bunch of stuff for .NET 7. So we're having to balance, uh, you know, bringing up an entire, entirely new uh, app model while also improving the Blazor framework in parallel. You basically have nothing to do here. <laughs> <laughs> Lots to do. Your, your days are work. totally free. <laughs> the the, the oppor <laughs> opportunities are many, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> That's an insane amount of stuff. It's yeah. Amazing. Yeah, we have a few questions more if you have time. Sure, I'm happy to stick okay. around. Pre-rendering with authentication is planned in .NET 7. Then how we use authentication if first page is login page? Yeah, um, don't... So we basically, our guidance right now is if you need authentication state, then don't pre-render that page. Like, uh, that's the, which is... That's not a great story. That's which is why we are fixing it for for .NET seven. But there's it's not a great way to do that right now. If you want to pre-render the content, I mean, I, I, from my understand, the part of the problem is like the the authentication state usually gets established client side for a, a client app like like Blazor. Blazor is fundamentally a browser based application. When you're pre-rendering, you're on the server, and then you got to have a way to flow the authentication state around or something. So, yeah, um, the guidance right now is basically. Pre-render the parts of your app that that don't need that authentication state. So we're, it's an area that we are we are working on. Uh, I would also point you to the pre-rendering docs uh, that have further uh, guidance on how to how to deal with this situation. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep. What is the current threading model in Maui Blazor scenario? Do native components use the same UA thread as the Blazor components? Uh, I don't know if I know the answer to to to, to that one. Um, that's a great question. I'd have to I'd have to check about whether the Blazor like I don't think the Blazor code like your components I don't think they run on the Maui like UI thread because they're unrelated to Maui's UI. But I could be wrong. I might have that totally wrong. So I'm I, I'm not. I'm gonna back up. I'm not gonna I'm gonna try and answer that one. I'm not sure. <laughs> what I can tell you though is like uh, for people that ask us about multi-threading for Blazor WebAssembly. Like Blazor WebAssembly has to run in the browser, right? So it's constrained by what the web platform can do, hence the need to get all the browsers to enable multi-threading support before we can actually implement it. In a Maui app or a Blazor hybrid app, you're running in a native application. Your .NET code is running on the normal .NET runtime. So all the normal .NET threading concepts apply. Um, you can spin up threads, you can access the file system, you can uh, touch the network however you like, You know, however at least the, the user will let you within the context of a native app. For the exact threading model that we use for the UI in in the uh, um, .NET Maui Blazor apps, I'm gonna have to go gonna have to go look that up. So good question. We'll have to follow up later. Uh, we can take this. What if I am on framework four point? Pinball. <laughs> <laughs> You're still supported. Your code will still run. I mean, .NET framework is part of Windows, so. As long as Windows keeps shipping <laughs> .NET Framework, then you will still be able to run your application and you'll be fine. Uh, yeah, we don't have Blazor support for um, for .NET Framework. Um, I hesitate to try to say this. There's a, you know, Blazor WebAssembly in particular isn't actually tied to anything .NET on the server. It's a purely client side thing. Um, so conceptually, I've never actually tried this, but conceptually, if you wanted to like throw in a Blazor WebAssembly, the Blazor WebAssembly script into a .NET framework-based ASP.NET app and, and render a components client-side on WebAssembly, that should work just fine. So that may be an option, uh, but it's not something that we like directly support or advocate right now. So if you're on .NET Framework 472 and you're happy there, then by all means, you can stay. You'll be, you'll be supported. If you're looking to modernize, like if you want to upgrade to .NET 6 and use ASP.NET Core and Blazor and these things, 
then I would point you at, uh, to the .NET Upgrade Assistant tool, which is available from the .NET website. Uh, that's a tool that you can point at your existing app, and it will try and help you uh, migrate that app to the latest modern uh, .NET workloads. Uh, depending on what your app is, that may have more or less success. Uh, if it's just like an MVC app, more success. If it's like a Windows Forms app or a WPF, WPF app, more success. If it's a Web Forms app, less success, like <laughs> not as much, because that's basically a rewrite at that point, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's where uh, you where you might try if you want to go the the modernization route. But if you, if you don't need to, then there's there's nothing that's requiring you to do so. How about integration with Storyblock for designing Blaze for components? That's a great great feature request. We we don't have any immediate plans to do that, but I think that's uh, certainly worth looking at. Uh, we'd love for you to suggest that on our GitHub repo and let the community express their 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 voice. I, I mean, the way we picked the features that I listed for .NET 7 is we look at all the GitHub issues people filed. We look at how many times they're thumbs upping them. We know that can be gamed a little bit, but still, we, we look at it. <laughs> um, we look at what customers are telling us. Um, we try and think strategically about where the web is going and where Blazor can be best positioned. So your feedback directly leads to what we then decide to do. So feel free to suggest it. If the community thinks it's important, then we'll prioritize it. What about Maui Blazor performance comparing to Ionic, PhoneGap, et cetera? Yeah, it's a good question. Like, so the, the performance of your Blazor components should be excellent, like, right? because you're running on a full .NET runtime. Like, there's, there's, a, you're, if you're on like Windows, you got a full JIT based runtime. You get all the, the, the benefits of all the optimizations that we've done in .NET. Um, how it, directly that uh, compares to like, say, Ionic's uh, rendering performance using the JavaScript runtime? I don't know. I mean, Ionic and PhoneGap have been around for a while, so I assume they've done a fair amount of performance optimization. But we we haven't done any direct benchmarking tests. Um, we should like that would be a, a totally legit thing to do. And uh, you know, if, if we're not as fast or significantly faster, I would be disappointed. And I think that'd be something we would want to to, to chase. People sometimes ask me the same question about like Blazor WebAssembly and like Angular and React. That one. The comparison's not as fair. Like we're having to bring a whole runtime with us, whereas they just get the runtime that's already there on the machine with the browser. <laughs> and so, yeah, we're not we're not going to win a, a horse race directly with those frameworks when running on WebAssembly today. Um, but we so in that world, we strive for good enough performance. Like you can be productive, use your .NET skills, and get your app done. On Maui, we should be able to do way better. I love how you say today. <laughs> <laughs> web platform evolves, right? Like at some yeah. point, if the enough WebAssembly features are there that we could do like a JIT runtime or do you know other optimizations or somehow pre-cache the runtime so you don't have to bring it down, then we could do uh, much, much better. Uh, it's all how the standardization effort moves moves forward. Yeah. Are Blazor server apps ideal on a web server cluster, web form environment? So Blazor server apps work fine in a cluster environment. The thing you have to keep in mind is that it is a connection-based model. So um, when a user browses to your app, they're going to set up that real-time connection between the browser and your server. And the server sets up some state associated with that connection. And that's how it's handling all the UI interactions. So once they're connected, they need to stay there, because otherwise, then all the, the state associated with that user gets, gets lost. Um, so you do need like sticky sessions and those types of things. Um, if the server goes down, if you, know, you have to, and you want to like preserve that um, circuit state, then you need some way to persist the circuit and be able to rehydrate it again for that user. You can do things at the application level to, to try and handle that. In .NET 7, we hope to add some features that will make that easier. Like if you're rolling out updates, we give you an API where we can say, hey, time to, time to hibernate or persist or whatever so that we can bring you back up later. Uh, but yes, you can use, use yourself in a, in a clustered environment. Uh, we have uh, we actually recommend using the Azure Signal R service as a way to handle uh, multiplexing uh, all the connections for connection-based scale-out. Um, yeah, it is, it is a, a concern. You do, when you have a Blazor server, you have to think about um, using your server resources to run the UI for every client that's, that's connected to you. It does a great job of that. Like You can handle tens of thousands of concurrent users with a Blazor server application, but that's something you do need to, to think about server side. With Blazor WebAssembly, it's all on the client. You're using their CPU and memory to run the application, so it's more like a, a static site. You can host your Blazor WebAssembly app on a static site hosting solution like Azure Static Web Apps and, and get phenomenal serverless uh, style scale out for, for the app. So both, both have, have their places, um, but they, they have those trade-offs. 
CSS installation doesn't work with an, with not native HTML tags. Mad button, for example. Styles are not applied. Are there any plans to fix it? So I think what you're hitting, those people who don't know what CSS isolation is, you can take a component and define a CSS style sheet that's specific to that component. It'll get scoped to that component. And when you do that, it, it doesn't go deep unless you tell it to. Like if you want styles um, that you define to go deep, then there's like a colon colon deep thingy that you have to add to your style. So that may be what you're hitting, I suspect. Um, could be wrong or it could be that uh, things are getting, I mean, Mudblazer has its own style sheets as well. So maybe there's some overriding there. I have to look, but uh, check to see if um, you're correctly using the, uh, the deep modifier. Um, that's my best guess. I know, Jimmy, if you have any thoughts on that one. That would be my guess as well. I, I don't understand why mod button wouldn't pick that up. But yeah, the selector for some reason not yeah. hitting the, not not hitting their button for some reason. Yeah, good question though. Um, if you have, for questions like this also where you're trying to get something to work, um, there's a, a lot. There's some really great Blazor communities that I would point people to if you haven't already joined. Like there's a Blazor Gitter, uh, ASP.NET slash Blazor. Uh, on the uh, .NET Discord, uh, there's a, a Blazor channel that you can go on there and chat with folks that can help you out. Stack Overflow, of course, is always available if you want to post your question to Stack Overflow. Or come to us on GitHub and uh, ask a question in, in a GitHub issue, and we'll we'll uh, see if we can help you out there, too. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for staying a little bit after your time. No problem. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. Thank you for putting together this great event. It's awesome to see all the awesome things you can do now with uh, .NET on the front end. Yes. Yes, my brain is mush. <laughs> but luckily, we have recorded all the sessions, and we will put them on YouTube. <laughs>